Friends, thank you so much for your patience. I was looking for my students to return their midterms, right? This is an educational institution. And that's really what we've come together for, is something deeply educative. How can we be formed by not just a moment, right, but by a vision that's being offered to us by Pope Francis? You know, the vision was given to him, perhaps, by the Holy Spirit to choose the name Francis. You might know the story that the cardinal from Brazil turned to him at the moment that his votes exceeded the necessary amount and said, don't forget about the poor. For Pope Francis was known as Cardinal Jorge Bergoglio for being the bishop of the slums, for taking the bus. And he said to himself, yes, the poor. And he said, Francis struck him, not just for the poor, Francis, St. Francis being known as the man of the poor, but also the man of the environment and ultimately the man of peace. Hence, we've brought together this frame of reference, prospects for peace, the poor, and the planet. But Pope Francis has followed this through with his teaching which we principally find in documentation, but we also need to look more closely at encounters, since his is a theology of encounter in motion. So what strikes me in the work of Pope Francis that helps us to frame our conversation is here we have the opportunity to understand what is it that he is doing in Evangelii Gaudium? You know, his successors, and this is no critique of them, had their own way of understanding what it means to evangelize. St. Pope John Paul II sought to re-catechize fallen away Catholics. Pope Benedict sought to rechristen Europe. Pope Francis's insight in Evangelii Gaudium is that the church can evangelize no one until it itself is evangelized by the poor. And so it must go to the periphery. There we will find the marginalized, there we will find the excluded. Evangelii Gaudium, his apostolic exhortation from 2013, really helps us understand then what is he doing in his encyclical Laudato Si of 2015. Those very poor that are to evangelize the church are intertwined Interrelated is the term that he uses with the fate of the earth. As goes the poor, they are the canary in the mine of the earth. And so if you are concerned about the fate of the earth, our environment, you must equally be concerned with the poor. And then finally, it's everyone's strong suspicion that his next encyclical will be on peace. Now, Bishop McElroy has helped us to recognize some really important action intellectually that's been going on, that Pope Francis has been renewing, recovering, and recreating. In the face of elements in the church, as well as in society, that simply want to retrench. What might it mean for us to walk alongside of him where he walks in encounter with renewal, recovery, and recreation on our minds. We have assembled this panel so that they might provide us additional perspectives to put in conversation with Bishop McElroy's talk earlier today. We've asked them jointly, but also individually to a degree to address geopolitical, ecumenical, and cultural concerns. And their backgrounds recommended them for a particular area, though we don't want to limit them to that. And so uh, to my left, Julie Rubio, professor of Christian ethics at St. Louis University, has done some wonderful work helping the church to understand what Pope Francis is doing, especially in the light of its critics and his critics, with Amoris Laetitiae.
we've asked Anant Rambashan, who is Professor of Comparative Religions, Asian Studies, and he's got the biggest portfolio up here, <laughs> to help us understand ecumenical and interreligious concerns coming from both his perspective of teaching, but also a different religious tradition. And I have always known Ann Thompson, since I grew up on NBC, as the Vatican correspondent, which I don't even think that's an official byline for her. But she has been such an amazing correspondent on the environment that when we thought about that one particular area, we thought this is the person that we want to speak to this. Because we have academic perspectives here. We have Christian perspectives here. We have Hindu perspectives here. We have journalistic perspectives here. But we have one thing that unites us. We have human perspectives here. And that's what we want to bring to the fore and understand how Pope Francis is calling us into encounter with a deeper human experience. So let us not avoid that. Let this be a very open and flowing conversation. You were reluctant to ask questions of Bishop McElroy earlier because he has this reputation of being a harsh teacher. No, <laughs> wake up. This is your moment, okay? Now it is Julie's moment, and so we asked Julie if she won't lead us in these conversations. Thank you so much, Julie. Can you hear me? Yes, okay. So I wanna begin by expressing appreciation for Bishop McElroy's talk. I have been a fan of him since I was in grad school and I read him on John Courtney Murray. And I agree with the basic themes that he lays out of renewal, reclamation, and recreation. And I appreciate how he suggests a way through the current divide on Francis by underlining both Francis' continuity with the past and the new lens of his Latin American experience. But I wanna pick up on three themes that emerged in the student questions. The causes of the increasing polarization about where Pope Francis is taking the church, how much the Pope's new vision is actually making a difference, and what any of us can do to respond. So to peace, poverty, and the planet, I would like to add polarization, progress, and potential. In my very brief remarks, I wanna bring some gender analysis to the fore as well, and I'll also look, as I tend to do, for common ground. So first, polarization. When we talk about the current polarization, I think it's really important to keep in mind that this is not unique to Francis. There was plenty of polarization during the pontificates of John Paul II and Benedict XVI that just came from different quarters. Also important to know that Francis remains incredibly popular. Um, his popularity currently among US Catholics stands at 84%, and that includes 79% of Catholic Republicans and 89% of Catholic Democrats. A little lower than JP II, <laughs> um, a little higher than Benedict XVI. Despite this reality, though, the polarization today is real, and one can see it especially in inner Catholic circles occupied by people who are deeply invested in the church, like seminaries and universities, theological societies, and universities, campus ministries, etc. So I agree with Bishop McElroy on the significance of the See, Judge, Act method in Francis' thought and that radicalizes his social ethic and perhaps creates some of the tension. But I wanna to point to another methodological shift that's crucial to understanding the polarization. Francis, I believe, applies a consistent ethical method to all social issues, including family and gender. And that is part of what makes him controversial. In Laudato Si on the environment and in Amoris Laetitia on the family, he uses an inductive approach moving from the ground up. He privileges the most vulnerable and he allows for complexity and diversity at the level of specific moral norms. In Laudato Si, the whole first part is Francis engaging in the science of climate change. He's reading the signs of the times. And in response to what he finds in the science, he indeed moves the church 
more away from dominion, closer to stewardship. And he takes a relatively thin existing concept of responsibility to future generations and really amplifies that. Now he says, given what we know, Catholics have a real responsibility of intergenerational solidarity to future generations. He draws out the implications of this strong ethic, but he still allows the, sp the specifics to be worked out in local contexts. He doesn't legislate. In Amoris Laetitia, despite what you may have heard, Francis really does uphold a beautiful Catholic vision of lifelong marriage between partners united in a passionate mutual love that grows through pain and sorrow and joy and risks staying together even when it would be easier to part. Francis repeats the traditional teachings on all the controversial issues, but he also reads the signs of the times. He looks at the challenges that poverty and migration, incarceration, and sexual diversity, for instance, pose to people who are trying to live in fidelity to the church's norms. He notes that God is at work in everyone's lives, and that in all kinds of ways, many of us who do not achieve the ideals may still realize those ideals, at least in a partial and analogous way. He stresses welcoming and inclusion, and especially of those who are hurt and vulnerable, seeing the person first, valuing the good in people's lives rather than focusing on where they may fall short. He insists every family, despite its weakness, can become a light in the darkness of the world. Once again, the specifics, how to welcome, how to include, have to be worked out at the local level. He doesn't legislate. This combination of challenge, refocusing on the vulnerable, and complexity is exciting for many of us. It seems like a mature ethic for responsible people, but it's troubling for some. Still, I think that Catholics can come to see the Pope's consistency, right? His relentless focus on the marginalized and his desire to challenge us while acknowledging the complexity of our lives. And if we can see that, there's hope that the polarization can be overcome. And that is crucial to making progress. So how much progress have we made? I would argue that the Francis effect is real. It is felt in all of the areas we've talked about at the level of authoritative church teaching. But some Notre Dame students asked, what does this mean on the ground? What is actually changing? So with regard to the planet, Laudato Si is, was widely anticipated not only by Catholics, but by scientists and environmental activists who are convinced that the movement needs religion and religious people because religious people can be motivated to change. Arguments about climate change are complicated and ordinary people remain divided about the seriousness of the situation, how much is our fault, what we need to do. But thanks to Francis, surveys are showing that more Catholics are convinced that climate change is happening, that humans are a part of it, and that climate change is a moral issue. Implementation of the document, including training priests and helping parishes think about things like energy use, it's in the early stages. But now that the environment has been defined as a life issue, because we know it is related to the deaths of people in the world's poorest countries, especially, especially by a, um, natural catastrophes and water issues, we can expect that more Catholics will begin to understand that their faith demands a response. Environmental theologian Christiana Peppard of Fordham notes that on the environment, the Vatican is way more progressive than the United States. It was carbon neutral and energy efficient even before Francis arrived. And today, Catholic advocacy on sustainable agriculture and water justice puts it in the forefront of the environmental movement. And that, as more and more Catholics are formed in this teaching, we can expect that effect to grow. What about poverty? Francis' centering of the church on poverty has been immense. John Paul II and Benedict XVI said many of the same things, but Francis has said them over and over again consistently. Right? Though little in his social teaching is completely new, the choice of what to say frequently and what not to say at all speaks volumes about priority. More than his predecessors, Francis has managed to convince large majorities of Christians and non-Christians that the church aspires to be a church for the poor. His personal choice to leave more simply, his visits with the poor when he visits countries, his prioritization of poor countries in his, in his travels, 
that all has made a difference. Even the things like reintegrating social justice heroes like Gustavo Gutierrez, Oscar Romero, his choices to install free laundromats and showers and other services for the poor in the Vatican, all of this grants his words an authenticity that is compelling. Still, we have to ask, well, what about those who are marginalized or made vulnerable by gender or sexual orientation? They are also the poor, the vulnerable. Here, the progress is murkier. While the Pope engages the sciences when writing on the environment, social sciences not explicitly engage when he writes about gender. Instead, we have vague references to things like gender ideology or gender theory that serve to marginalize or oversimplify whole discourses and shut down conversation. Calls for a new theology of women fail to recognize the wealth of feminist theology that already exists and seems to reaffirm the idea that women are different and in need of some kind of special analysis. While theologians like Walter Casper and Gustavo Gutierrez are re-emerging, re women theologians, especially those with feminist sensibilities, are largely absent from public ecclesial discourses and they were largely absent from the Synod on the Family. The Pope's references to the feminine genius of women theologians, who he famously and unfortunately said are the strawberry on the cake, <sighs> yeah, um, have only rarely translated into engagement of women's expertise in theological discussions on family, sex, and gender. When it comes to these issues, the attention to mercy and justice, humility and complexity that mark Pope Francis's approach to other issues is much less evident. There are some signs of hope, uh, the commission ap appointed to study the possibility of women deacons, attention to sexism and sexual violence that is really significant in Morris Letizia, the appointment of women to some important Vatican positions. And these are important and there is a long overdue renewal of a question on the conversation about what women can do in the church. And that's important. On LGBTQ issues, we find some damaging rhetoric in speeches and interviews mixed with his willingness to encounter people, no matter what, and listen to their experience. I also would note that support from bishops and cardinals for James Martin's bridge building work is really significant, and so is the absence of correction coming from the Vatican. Right? Martin now has 184,000, as of this morning, followers on Twitter. It's not much compared to the Pope, but it's a pretty big deal. <laughs> um, and his book is being translated into four different languages. Despite protests, he is holding forth at forums all over the country. They're sold out. Now, he's advocating respect, inclusion, and compassion. He's getting the church to think about what those things mean, not changing anything. But this represents a sea change in Catholic rhetoric and practice. And the fact that it's going on now matters. On poverty in the planet and to a lesser extent sex and gender, concrete change is happening on the ground. Finally, what about potential? What can we do? I am so appreciative that students are asking this question. Some might see Francis as a pope who tells us we're all doing great, don't worry, you don't need to change because he's the one who says, you know, who am I to judge, right? Um, but I think anyone who listens to Francis knows that he is judging all the time, actually. Um, he's prophetic, that's, that's what he does. But he mixes that pro prophetic judgment with mercy. So yes, we have to ask, what can we do? With regard to peace, if Francis is recovering the church's early pacifist roots, as Bishop McElroy um, suggests, and continuing the church's movement toward peacemaking by showing the viability of nonviolence, what might me, we be doing to become better peacemakers? He showed us in the Synod on the family that it is possible to get warring factions of the church to stay in the room and keep talking to each other. And he told them that their dialogue was fundamentally important. He has revived the idea of dialogue as a fundamental Christian practice rooted in love of neighbor and in a willingness to go beyond the surface and see others in their deepest dignity. In our Catholic universities, in our Catholic parishes, we can become places where people learn to talk across those lines of division. This is a skill that students know they need. In my visits to Jesuit campuses with uh, a group called the National Seminar for Jesuit Higher Education, we hear students tell us over and over, 
We, don't, we see division on campus, we don't like division on campus, and we don't know what to do with it. And actually our professors aren't that much help most of the time. Right? They're not trained to help us in these conversations. Um, I know that there's a course here called The Good Life, where you are working hard on getting um, and being involved in, conversa in difficult conversations. That may seem like no big deal, but I would call that kind of conversation building as nonviolence work that's happening from the ground up. Just like your immersion trips, your efforts to learn other cultures and, and languages, and your cultivation of friendships with people who differ from you. With regard to poverty and the planet, much of the work to heal society is gonna happen at the structural level, not soup kitchens and carrying your own water bottle, although those are good, um, but working for sustainable agriculture and water justice. But if you can move from the personal choices to community actions, then they become more important. So as we cultivate those, in, those intentional personal practices, then can we become the kinds of people who ask questions about the budgets of our university? For instance, if we're talking about poverty, how much are we devoting to financial aid? What is the economic diversity of our student body? Are sexism and racism being systematically addressed in our curriculum? How do, are we supporting our immigrant and refugee students, as well as those made vulnerable by sex, gender, and race? Next week, I'm going to a small college in Pennsylvania where I'm going to talk with faculty, students, and people working in parishes about how to make their institutions more welcoming and inclusive. And I know Bishop McElroy has asked parishes in his diocese to consider similar questions via diocesan-wide synod on Amoris Laetitia. Catholic institutions, we are just beginning to figure this out, how we need to change in response to Pope Francis, where Pope Francis is moving the church. But each of us can strive to be the person in the room who's asking the hard questions and figuring out how to shift priorities so we can be a part of Francis's project. In conclusion, despite ongoing polarization, there has been significant progress in the five years of Francis and most Catholics, we have to remember this, most Catholics are eager for that work to continue. One Notre Dame student in the questions wondered though, is all this popularity going to translate into more energy for Christianity? Right. So far, there's really not much evidence that it has. There is no great uptick in confirmations, baptisms, marriages, or mass attendance. In fact, all of that continues to decline. There is a little slight uptick for Jesuits, though. We've got the, the Francis bump for the Jesuits. <laughs> All right. It may take a little longer for people to see that Francis is not acting from a political agenda, but from the heart of Catholicism. His Holy Thursday foot washings are every bit as important to his papacy as his encyclicals. The more we ourselves see and help others see the connection between the core of Christian faith and peace, poverty, and the planet, the better. Though many will continue to appreciate Francis from outside Christianity, from the vantage point of another religion or none at all, which is fine, some may eventually come to see this, that the Jesus who called for love of enemies and the ritual practice of sharing a sign of peace at mass with strangers are fundamental to the church's embrace of peace building. That the Jesus who was crucified for stirring up the people and challenging the money changers and saying woe to the rich and a church that provides more social services than anyone else but the government is fundamental. All of that is fundamental to Catholic teaching on poverty. That the God who created the world and entrusted it to human stewardship along with saints like Francis of Assisi are fundamental to Catholic embrace of stewardship in the environment. And that the Jesus who ate with sinners and outcasts, who created controversy through his countercultural interactions with women and with people who were known to be sexual transgressors in their time are fundamental to the church's imperfect embrace of sex and gender ju justice. In the life of Jesus and the practices of the church, that's where the common ground lies, and that's the heart of Pope Francis's message. Thank you very much, Julie. There'll be time for questions with each individual panelist as also a conversation.
at the end of each present, uh, at the end of all the presentations together. So, Anand, if you won't lead us in the next step in this encounter, please. Thank you very much, uh, Father Sandberg, and uh, greetings, uh, honored friends. It is a joy to be here and to have this opportunity to share some thoughts on Pope Francis, and I'll focus in a very special way on uh, the Pope and interreligious uh, dialogue. Last October, I participated in the Religions for Peace annual meeting in Rome. The theme of the meeting was advancing a moral alliance among the world's religions for integral ecology. The team was obviously inspired by Pope Francis's encyclical Laudato Si, calling for dialogue and cooperation in addressing the urgent problems of environmental degradation and global warming. During this meeting, our group had an audience with Pope Francis. In his remarks to us, the Pope emphasized the need for interreligious cooperation to oppose violent conflicts, to advance sustainable development, and to protect the earth. He spoke of the special obligations of the world's religions with their spiritual and moral resources to be peace builders and condemn those who justify and engage in acts of violence in the name of religion. Religion, said Pope Francis, are bound by the very nature to promote peace through justice, fraternity, disarmament, and care for creation. The theme of interreligious dialogue and cooperation in the pursuit of peace, justice, and sustainable development is one that resonates consistently in the speeches and writings of the Pope. Such cooperation, the Pope emphasizes, must be grounded in relationships of friendship and mutual respect between persons of different traditions. Now, I've examined, I hope, most of what Pope Francis has said on interreligious dialogue. And I want to highlight quickly five of the significant themes that I see in his uh, writings and, and statements. Each one of these could be the subject of a longer conversation, but here I just identify these five uh, themes. Next slide, please. So first, interreligious dialogue does not involve renouncing one's identity. In the words of the Pope, true openness involves remaining steadfast in one's deepest conviction and clear and joyful in one's identity. Without a solid identity, the Pope contends, dialogue is of no use. It might even be harmful. Second, interreligious dialogue and evangelization are not mutually exclusive, but mutually nurturing. The same point is made by the Pope in pointing to an essential connection between dialogue and proclamation. We must, according to Pope Francis, avoid what he calls a diplomatic openness, which affirms everything in other religions. Third, Interreligious dialogue requires that we cultivate the ability to enter into the other's heart, to put ourselves in their shoes, to understand and grasp their deepest concerns. It is an exercise in love and empathetic understanding. I find the Pope's words on this requirement of dialogue the most appealing, powerful, and challenging. And I quote uh, one paragraph. We are challenged to listen not only to the words which others speak, but to the unspoken communication of their experiences and hopes and aspirations, their struggles and their deepest concerns. Such empathy must be the fruit of our spiritual insight and personal experience, which lead us to see others as brothers and sisters and to hear in and beyond their words and actions, 
what their hearts wish to communicate, end of quote. Fourth, interreligious dialogue does not aim to overcome diversity. The Pope is opposed to all efforts aimed at rigid uniformity. The unity that he espouses is one that is built on the basis of our diversity of languages, cultures, and religions. He speaks about a diversity accepted and reconciled. And finally, and fifth, interreligious dialogue finds its most important purpose and fulfillment in interreligious cooperation for peace, the overcoming of poverty, hunger, violence, and moral decay, and in addressing our environmental crisis and the pursuit of justice. The call of Pope Francis for interreligious cooperation centered on overcoming injustice, violence, and poverty, and in effectively responding to our environmental crisis is grounded in a recognition that the world's religions do offer resources for addressing these challenges. His call will not be meaningful in the absence of this acknowledgement. Next slide, please. 125 years ago, a young Hindu monk, Swami Vivekananda, delivered a series of addresses at what was the first global interreligious dialogue meeting, just 100 miles, I think, from here in Chicago at the Parliament of the World's uh, Religions. There is a remarkable convergence in concerns and priorities between Pope Francis and uh, one of the youngest and greatest of Hindu uh, teachers. And I, I wanted to highlight uh, just a few of these places of convergence. First, they both share an optimism about the ethical resources, the ethical potential of the world's religions. Uh, 72 years before the proclamation of Nostra Aetate by Pope Paul VI in 1965, exhorting Catholics to recognize, preserve, and promote the good things, spiritual and moral, in other religions. Swami Vivekananda, in his address to the parliament, reminded his audience that holiness, purity, and charity are not the exclusive possessions of any church in the world, and that every system has produced men and women of the most exalted character. Second, they both condemn powerfully all violence that is legitimized by appeals to religion. In his very first address to the parliament on September 11, 1893, Swami Vivekananda, like Pope Francis 120 years later, lamented violence in the name of religion that drenched the earth often with human blood, destroyed civilization, sent communities into despair. Vivekananda called for an end to persecution in the name of religion with the sword or the pen, to fanaticism, to uncharitable feelings among followers of different traditions. Third, Swami Vivekananda and Pope Francis share a commitment to the poor and to the overcoming of poverty. They understand this commitment to be fundamental to living out the meaning of a religious life. Swami Vivekananda founded a new mission, a new Hindu mission, after his return from the United States with the motto, for the welfare of the world and for one's own salvation. Atmano Moksharatam Jagat Hitaya Chair. More than, actually, more than 50 years before liberation theology developed into a major movement, Swami Vivekananda was already expressing what would become one of his defining doctrines. This is the preferential option for the, for the poor. He coined a very famous phrase, God in the poor. In Sanskrit, he spoke of Daridra Narayana, to call attention to the special claims of the poor on the world's resources and energies. I do not believe, said Vivekananda, in a God or a religion which cannot wipe the widow's tears or bring a piece of bread to the orphan's mouth. Very similar 
to what I saw as Pope Francis' uh, commitment in Evangelii Gaudium, when he, where he emphasized the obligation of every community to be an instrument of God for the liberation and promotion of the poor and for enabling them to be a fully a part of society. And Vivekananda also embodied a deep self-criticism of his own tradition. In one of his most, uh, in one, in one of uh, a letter that he wrote to one of his disciples in 1893 from the United States, he said as follows, no religion on earth preaches the dig dignity of humanity in such a lofty strain as Hinduism and no religion on earth treads upon the necks of the poor and the low in such a fashion as the Hindu tradition. They both identified indifference as the great sickness of their, of their times. Fought for both Swami Vivekananda and Pope Francis in different ways, the inspiration to work for the overcoming of poverty and indifference is the call to see the divine present in human beings. The Isha Upanishad begins with a famous call to see everything in the world of movement as pervaded by God, Isha. There is no life outside of God, and there is nothing that exists which is not sustained by God. Every human encounter is an encounter with God. And we know that one of the Pope's favorite uh, uh, Christian texts, Matthew 25, 31 to 36, speaks of God as present in the poor and the needy, and to care for the poor is also to care for the divine. So Pope Francis's call for interreligious dialogue that is concerned primarily with the pursuit of peace and justice and sustainable ecology is one I believe certainly the Hindu tradition and the world's religions will welcome. The possibilities for common action and cooperation around these concerns are immense. But I want to conclude with highlighting some of the tensions that I also see in this arena of, of dialogue. And I highlight these with, with very deep appreciation for the Pope's leadership uh, in interreligious dialogue. First, reading through the Pope's statements, one cannot miss the fact that some traditions receive a lot more attention than other traditions. In Evangelii Gaudium, for example, Judaism and Islam are discussed in significant detail, but the Hindu and the Buddhist traditions ignored. And I know that dialogue is also context and, uh, and history uh, driven, but you know, there, are still, there, there, uh, there is still the phenomena of, of proximate and remote remote uh, traditions that go back also to the Nostra Aetate um, uh, document. And I think this perhaps uh, is a tension that awaits uh, addressing. Second, and perhaps even more important uh, from my perspective, is the significant tension between the Pope's emphasis on both interreligious dialogue and evangelization or proclamation. The tension between interreligious dialogue and commitment to evangelization extends also to, Pope's, to the Pope's statements on religious diversity. In Evangelii Gaudium, Gaudium, the Pope speaks of learning to accept others and their different ways of living, thinking, and speaking. And later in the same document, he returns to emphasizing the inseparability of interreligious dialogue and evangelization. How does one affirm a value for religious diversity and interreligious dialogue in the context of an overall goal of evangelization? How can one be committed to diversity as a religious good if the ultimate aim is evangelization? At a minimum, this tension creates uncertainty about the value of one's tradition in the eyes of one's dialogue partner. As a Hindu, I do have special theological commitments. But any claim 
to absolute theological self-sufficiency is challenged by the caution that in relation to God, all claims to full comprehension or description are mistaken and inadequate. Truth is always more than I can define, describe, or understand with my finite mind and, and symbols and, and language. What is ruled out is the fullness of knowledge. The implication is that I can only profess my commitment with humility and an openness always to the possibility of learning from and being enriched by the ways people of other traditions know and describe the infinite one. Gandhi always reminded his partners in dialogue about the necessity of receiving as well as giving. You cannot take, he said. You cannot give, he said, without taking, without receiving. When these two words, evangelization and dialogue, are consistently paired in this manner, I can tell you, it is the word evangelization that resounds in the Hindu air because of long historical experience. People of other traditions become suspicious that interreligious dialogue is a new instrument for evangelization. Words like evangelization, proclamation, and mission are the emb embedded ones that image Christianity in the minds of many people of other religious traditions. And the need to use these consistently side by side with dialogue does not always help fostering uh, the kinds of relationships that are desirable. It is as though the Christian feels that any discourse about interreligious dialogue that does not equally underscore evangelization betrays what it means to be Christian, does it? Must interreligious dialogue always be paired with evangelization? Or does it have an integrity of its own? But I discern or oh, I glimpse new directions in Pope Francis, a new mode of sharing. There are various hints and suggestions in his statements and writings of a different approach. I discern new theological notes that emphasize both sharing and receiving, as well as the need to overcome theological self-sufficiency. And I want to end with two quotations from, from the Pope. The first is from an address that he gave to the bishops of Asia in 2014. This quote is preceded by a very beautiful passage from the Pope to the bishops where he spoke eloquently and profoundly about dialogue as openness, receptivity, acceptance, he said, of the, of the other. And uh, then he himself anticipated a question from his audience. And he phrased the question like this. But Brother Pope, this is what we are doing. In other words, we are engaging in dialogue in the manner that you describe. But we are, we are converting no one or very few people. So it's a revealing concern since it emerges from the anxiety that interreligious dialogue that does not result in conversion is without fruit. And this brings me to the, this is the Pope's response. But you're doing it anyway. With your identity, you are hearing the other. What was the first commandment of God our Father to our Father Abraham? Walk in my presence and be blameless. And so with my identity and my empathy, my openness, I walk with the other. I don't try to make him come over to me. I don't proselytize. Pope Benedict told us clearly, the church does not grow by proselytizing, but by attracting. In the meantime, let us walk in the Father's presence. Let us be blameless. Let us practice the first commandment. This is where encounter, dialogue will take place. 
with identity, with openness. It is a path to greater knowledge, friendship, and solidarity. So here the Pope seems, as I read in this statement, to be severing any necessary connection between proselytization and, and dialogue, and seems to be saying that what we need to be in our relationship with people of other traditions is faithfulness to our own uh, commitments. And uh, uh, secondly, the second passage, again, it, this is, uh, it comes from a meeting of the Pope with uh, religious leaders in Albania, also in 2014, where I hear the Pope speaking of the religious need for the other, not just a political need for the other, but a need that, that goes deeper. Uh, countering religious self-sufficiency, and he uses here the, the metaphor of the pilgrim. So deep down, we are all pilgrims on this earth. On this pilgrim journey, as we yearn for truth and eternity, we do not live autonomous and self-sufficient lives. Interesting that, that word self-sufficient was used. The same applies to religious, cultural, and national communities. We need each other and are entrusted to each other's care. Each religious tradition from within must be able to take account of others. So here, the, I, I read here a very um, inviting refutation of religious self-sufficiency and a need for, for the other. So let me conclude by saying that, you know, as a, as a Hindu, I welcome the Pope's call for interreligious dialogue and cooperation centered on the pursuit of peace and justice and the overcoming of suffering. I agree wholeheartedly that such dialogue calls us also with urgency to reverence for our common home, the earth, and to united efforts to halt its degradation, to promote theological, ecological responsibility. This dialogue will only grow deeper through a humility that acknowledges the limits of our own knowledge, especially in relation to God, and which truly opens our hearts and minds, not only to give, but to receive from, and to be enriched by the gifts of our neighbors of all religions. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Anand, for reshaping us in this way. And Anne now will continue to expand the encounter for us. Thank you, Father Kevin and Father Bill, for bringing me here to lower the curve of this panel. <laughs> um, if I graduated from Notre Dame, and I went into journalism. And if you graduate from Notre Dame and you go into journalism, you will be asked to cover two things in your career, sports, and the Catholic Church. And so that is how I ended up being in St. Peter's Square on Wednesday, March 13th, or March 13th, 2013, when on a very cold and rainy night, I stood there and watched the smoke turn white. In the NBC, in our workspace, we had a sign that said, black smoke, nope, white smoke, pope. And then, <laughs> We're real clever, aren't we? And um, Cardinal Turan then came out on the balcony and announced that Jorge Mario Bergoglio was the next pope. And the entire square went, huh? Because he wasn't who people expected. He wasn't the person who was being talked about incessantly as the cardinals went into the conclave. So fast forward five years later, and on this past Easter Sunday, Pope Francis in his sermon spoke of God as the God of surprises. Well, I would argue that Pope Francis is the Pope of surprises. He was essentially elected by his brother cardinals to clean up the Curia and make the Vatican more responsive to a glo growing global church. And Francis has tried to make headway on both those issues. But in his first five years, his papacy has been marked by the ability, all on his own, to make a genuine connection with the people of the world, regardless of their faith. 
to create that counter or that culture of encounter that he speaks of so often. And anyone who tells you they saw it coming isn't telling the truth. He has stunned the world and the church by changing the public perception of this 2,000-year-old institution. He's done so by being authentic, not perfect, certainly not always rehearsed, and critics would say not always well thought out, but by being himself and by demonstrating how to live a life of faith in a modern world. I know you want to talk about Francis's words, and we will, but I would be remiss if I did not note that this pope preaches as much by gestures as sentences. And those gestures of peace, of caring for the poor, of protecting our planet, those are the guideposts, I think, to that life of faith. I have been lucky enough to travel on the papal plane to Rio, South Korea, Cuba, the US, Mexico, Kenya, Uganda, and the Central African Republic. And I have followed Pope Francis to the Middle East, the Philippines, Assisi, Ecuador, and Colombia. And I, and I have witnessed that silent but powerful preaching. And it is in that gospel of gestures that I think you will find the answer to what, as I, what I took as a theme of your questions. And that is that the problems of the world that Francis asked people to act on are so overwhelming. How can I, as one person, one student, have an impact? Yes, our world's problems are complicated, they are big, and they are difficult. But here I think Francis's papacy is very instructive. I look at him and see him saying everyone can help solve some of the thorniest problems we face by doing something. Take the world's refugee crisis. When the Syrian refugees were fleeing Europe, Francis challenged each parish in Europe to adopt a refugee family. Some cardinals protested. Francis wasn't having any of it because he, in turn, decided to do something to show it was possible. He went to Lesbos, Greece, and he brought three families to Rome on the papal plain. Twelve people chosen who were all Muslim, who had all their papers in order. And that was the only qualification. It didn't matter what your faith was, what your job was, what your dreams were. He only asked that the families have their papers in order. It struck the families so strange that one of the fathers actually thought it was a trick to send them back to Turkey. He didn't believe the Pope was really going to take them to Italy. Francis didn't solve that crisis, but he did show how something could be done. In 2014, in August of 2014, he went to South Korea. It was five months after the ferry accident that killed some 300 high school students. Everywhere you went in Seoul, there were yellow ribbons in memory of the victims and in protest of the South Korean government's failure to hold an independent investigation into the ferry accident's cause. Francis, we were told, would not get into the specifics of the disaster or the decisions that the government had made when he met with its leaders. But he did meet with the families, and his first encounter with the families was before a mass at a soccer stadium in Daejeon. They met with him before that celebration. And after mass, I'm talking to some of them, and they are all showing me their pictures of him on their iPhone. And all of a sudden, we happen to notice that during the mass, there's something on his cassock. And they start blowing up the picture. And they look. It was a yellow ribbon. One of the family members had given him a yellow ribbon pin. And the Pope put it on, and he wore it throughout his trip to South Korea. Some of the families had camped out in the main square in Seoul, where the Pope was going to say mass. And it was a big problem for the government. The government actually hoped the church could get the families to move out. The archdiocese was having none of that. In fact, when the Pope went around the square that day before mass, it stopped at one of the fathers who had camped out there. He was staging a hunger strike in the square. Francis got out of the Pope mobile and went to the man and hugged him. Later on the plane, with the ribbon still on his cassock, he said he stopped there 
to hug the man and wore that ribbon throughout the trip to show solidarity with the families in great grief. It meant everything to those heartbroken people. Pope Francis has lent his moral authority to the fight against climate change with, the, with Laudato Si. He's written that clean water is a human right. He has warned that the poorest will feel the first and most dire impacts of our warming planet. And that developed nations of the world who fueled this crisis have a responsibility to help poor nations. As he travels, he praises the natural resources and the, of the countries he visits, and he always takes time to encourage people to take care of God's creation. In his visit to Washington, D.C., Francis stood in the well of Congress and talked about climate change, saying in his speech that he's convinced that we can make a difference by instituting a culture of care. But, I, but what I remember most from that visit, and it's the picture I can't forget, is him pulling up to the White House in that little Fiat 500L, which got 25 miles to the gallon in the city and 33 on the highway. And that little compact Fiat was surrounded by these big hulking SUVs. It was nothing fancy, nothing extra, just what the Pope needed to get from point A to point B. At the center of Francis's papacy is charity and mercy. His focus on the poor, whether they be poor in spirit or poor in wallet, begins with listening. On almost every trip, he shares a meal with the homeless in that city or country he's visiting. And what is striking about those meals is that those who have broken bread with Francis at those encounters say he pretty much just listens, and they find it extraordinary. Because when you are homeless, apparently no one listens. But this pope does. In Rome, he has taken that knowledge, and he has used it and convinced his almoner, as Julie mentioned, to set up showers and laundromats and hair services for the homeless. Because apparently, you can get a meal in Rome if you're homeless, but only a shower and a haircut can help remove the visible stigmas of your situation. While this gospel of gestures draws the world in, it certainly has not insulated Francis from some of the persistent problems of the church. And there are two I am watching as his papacy starts its new year. The first is his response to the abuse crisis. He certainly shocked people with his defensive response to a reporter's question about Bishop Barros in Chile, who was accused of covering up for his mentor, an abusive priest. Francis, realizing that he had, to use a very, fairly common phrase, stepped in it, has now sent a special prosecutor to look into those claims. And in August, the Pope will go to Ireland for the World Meeting of Families, where the wounds are still very raw from the cover-up and the abuse of children in that country. Both situations are real tests for a Pope who has been criticized for not, make, for, not ending, for not making ending abuse a priority in his papacy. The other issue, as Julie mentioned, is women. Pope Francis appointed a commission to study the possibility of women deacons, but not much has seemed to have happened. And yes, a woman now heads the Vatican Museum, but in general, it's hard to find women in jobs of true influence and importance within the church hierarchy. America, the Jesuit magazine, published a survey that found only 24% of women who identified as Catholic went to mass at least weekly. A little more than half prayed every day. And millennial women are particularly discouraged, reports Notre Dame's Kathy Sprose Cummings, director of the Kushwa Center. She points to data that shows millennial women are more likely than millennial men to say they do not attend mass. That's the first generation of Catholic, Catholic women where this is the case. But while there are problems, there is also opportunity. That same America survey shows half of the women are proud to be Catholic, and most, some 82%, haven't considered leaving the church, but they aren't participating. It is a very big problem, 
And I can tell you from my reporting in Boston that women helped keep that archdiocese together during the abuse crisis. And I think if you look at your own life, you'll probably find it's your mom or your grandmother or maybe a nun, not Sister Jean, but women who are often the initial and lasting connection with the church. Now, abuse victims and women want this Pope of Surprises to turn his attention to them. Thank you. Thank you, Anne. And thank you, all of our panelists. You have spoken of the methodological shift, including the polarization and the prioritization that is important to consider in looking at Pope Francis. You have spoken about his humility and openness, but recognized that that won't be authentic if there are claims to theological self-sufficiency that are embedded in our practice and our thought. And you have given us, Anne, this beautiful image of the gospel of gestures. What else do you want to hear from your panelists here? The microphones are here for you to address your questions so that all can hear. You might address it particularly to a panelist, but we have a die up here. Uh, they don't know, right? And then they'll just be assigned the answer. No. <laughs> First of all, I'd like to thank you all for being here tonight. Uh, Bishop McElroy, uh, you had alluded to in your keynote uh, the geographic uh, implications of the support of, uh, well, of the, the methodology, if you will, of, of this pope, uh, given that two thirds of, uh, given that two thirds of the, the church live in that southern, I don't remember your exact phrasing, I apologize, but. Um, so that's the geographic element. I was wondering if there's also a generational element to all of this. Um, for those who are uh, not impressed by the Pope or those who are particularly entrenched uh, either in the, the hierarchy of the Vatican or in the uh, local parishes. Um, is there a generational dynamic to all of this? Thank you. Thank you, Paul. I'd like to address this first. Can I give it a shot? Oh, yeah, I'm not sure. Uh, and I'm trying to think of my, my, my own students, and, and it has more to do with a kind of polarization rather than their age. Some of them are quite interested and enthused by, by Pope Francis. Some of them are really worried. And when I spoke in one venue about Amoris Laetitia, there was a lot of, uh, lot of concern and a lot of, a lot of people with their, their documents ready to ask me about that footnote. Um, so. And, and, I, and I imagine among older Catholics, it's similar. I, I know some on the left that are, that are more disappointed and some on the right also. So I'm not sure if it maps generationally. Yeah, I don't, uh, I was just thinking, I don't, I don't see it so much as generational, more as philosophical. Um, I think, in, and in particular, when you go and you speak to, I think of speaking to seminarians over at the North American College in Rome, and, and um, you know, those who are inspired by St. John Paul II, um, they, they struggle at times because what, it, they're sort of like, what's happening with the church? And I think, um, I think, the, I think the difference here is that you have a pope who has decided that he is going to make an effort to meet people where they're at, for lack of a better phrase, as opposed to um, dealing with putting the theology for first. It's more, it's more practical first. It gets back to what you said, Father Kevin, about the church being a field hospital. The most important thing is when you see somebody 
who is wounded to help them regardless of how they've gotten those wounds or what's happened. It's that healing power, that grace that comes first. And I think what I would, what I would say is um, I think some of the Pope's approaches to certain questions are helpful. The judgmentalism question, for example, in terms of with younger people. But I, I, I fear we're facing on the whole millennial question simply a catastrophic gulf, and we don't know how to approach it. Uh, I would say that as a bishop who's interested in this question and considers it the most pressing pastoral issue we have in the United States, if not the world. And, um, and we've tried in our diocese to make some steps. I, I'm baffled by it as to how, how productively to approach this question. Um, because at least with ideological divides, there's engagement. Mm -hmm. What I fear is the disengagement, mm -hmm. uh, the indifference, the it doesn't matter. Uh, and and that, that's what I'm afraid we're facing in the life of the church with 20 to 40. Uh, certainly not across the board, but I mean, it, it, it's a huge challenge to us. Well, I, of course, I can't speak specifically to the issue of the church, but I, I can speak from the, the vantage point of a college professor for 30 years, teaching at a, not at a Catholic, but at a Lutheran institution, and where most of my students do come from a Christian uh, background. And uh, I, 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 you know, I don't want to claim to understand what Anne said, but Anne said the problem is not generational, but philosophical. And uh, if, I, if I hear what you say, in my, own, in my own students, I certainly do not, have not in these 30 years seen any absence of interest in the fundamental questions of religion, in questions of meaning, in the search for authenticity uh, in, in life, the very kinds of questions. And that's why they, they, they keep coming to religion classes because many of them are hoping that in these classes, these, these kinds of questions would be properly uh, addressed. I think that, uh, um, that we, have, we have, as the bishop said, there's a crisis in how we are able to speak from the depths of our own uh, traditions and relate the, the, the deep insights of our traditions to their own quest for meaning in the ways in which they are formulating and expressing those, um, those, those questions. But I, 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 I discern, however you want to name it, a very, very profound and living um, spirituality, a quest for spiritual meaning in, in, in my students. And I think this is a challenge for us from the religious traditions, how we would speak to that, that thirst that is there and how, 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 we, how we respond um, to that to that thirst. But it's, it's part of the humanity to wrestle with these deep existential questions about meaning. You can't do it without, the very fact that you're human, you know, makes these questions living mm -hmm. and they're certainly present in our students. I think that's well said and especially this idea of the crisis of authenticity with which a millennial generation would look at a figure like Pope Francis and ask whether this actually measures up and what narrative do they have to measure that against to what next? My question is about the effectiveness or lack thereof of the Pope in translating the gestures and the symbol and the wonderful preaching and presence into actual reform of the church. Austin Ivory wrote a wonderful biography of Bergoglio after he'd been pope for a couple of years. The title was The Great Reformer. Ross Douthat of the New York Times columnist has a new book out right off the presses that might be called The Failed Reformer. His critique is that Pope Francis has done some wonderful things in terms of, for example, I'd take the, use the example of the breathtaking speech he gave to the Curia on New Year's Eve, turning that annual address into well, turning over the 
tables in the temple, uh, you know, castigating the curia to their faces. But Douthat's critique is that not much has really changed, despite the convening of the cardinals and, and good intentions, that there hasn't really yet been genuine reform of the curia. Some of the same faces are still around. I'm not sure this is true or not, but that's the argument. Also, on the question of women, the deacons commission and so forth, Anne alluded to, not much has been done. So I don't mean this as a spirit of severe critique of, of the pope. I have two questions, though. Is this a fair assessment after five years? Great intentions, inspiration, wonderful gestures, but in terms of institutional reform, not much to show. If it is true, how do we account for that? How do we account for, we know the Curie is impossible to reform in a way, but nonetheless, how do we account for the lack of progress on real institutional reform if that narrative is correct? I hesitate to say this to a historian, but uh, the Pope has these interesting little phrases, this is more important than that, that I don't understand really, but one of them is time is more important than space. And I think uh, part of my response would be the impact of this pontificate will be quite different if we're meeting here ten, five years from now to celebrate 10 years than if we're not. Or if we're, you know, the, at the beginning of the pontificate, one of the, the cardinals made the cardinals shortly after the pontificate began was told by another cardinal, be careful, this one's not going to be around too long. Mm. And yet he's lasted five years and seems, what I see him, very robust and energetic. So I think the question, part of the question is, how long will this be, as with all institutional questions then, who will be the successor? Will some of these patterns have a, a chance to gel? But um, there, there, is, there is a question about whether the momentum has, has stalled out. I don't think it's stalled out, but it's, it's slowing down in certain mm -hmm. ways. The institutional inertia is just so tremendous, as so many of us know, uh, in the life of the church. And so you, uh, I think things have begun, but if all of these things that have been talked about, the, the diaconate commission, for example, if they all become either unfulfilled expectations, particularly the ones like the diaconate question, that to me that train shouldn't have been started if there wasn't a, an end point in mind. And, and, and I fear, uh, now, I'm ho still hoping that there's gonna be an end point that is, uh, you know, that the, 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 the ordination of women to the diaconate will have been found to be historical and that it will be reinstituted, however, I don't know that, and I, I felt more strongly that a few years ago, you know, when it was just starting. But, um, so I think there does have to be a question mark. Um, uh, at the same time, I do think that these, there are certain uh, things that will not easily be reversed, and some of them we're talking about. I think Laudato Si and the trajectory on the environment will not easily be reversed now. That's a major change in the life of, the, of, of our theology and, and uh, the Catholic approach to the question of the environment. That's, that's a hugely important question. It's not going to go backwards. Uh, I, I do think on the whole question of war and peace, this new pathway um, will likely be solidified within a few years. Now, that doesn't mean it's going to answer all the questions because I think most of us who work, have worked in this field a bit have real questions about whether, I do, whether pacifism as, a, as an umbrella scheme can work in, in the world in which we live in. But as, but as a part of Catholic teaching, it seems to be great. So uh, I do think there are major elements on the track that are already there and moving out of the station and have moved enough out of the station that they will have a significant impact, and those are very important. The institutional reforms, the key question is, those can always be undone by, by a successor. So, uh, but whether they take roots, I will say this, and I think it's very important. Um, 
and I say this with all institutional leaders, I think, that, or most institutional leaders in the church, that the decentralization has begun and has taken roots. Just the very way now, I've been a bishop since 2010. The difference in how I feel about uh, being undercut uh, by something from an office in Rome is tremendous now. It's, it's just a, it's, it, it's a whole cultural change uh, for the life of bishops, not just bishops, but the, you know, frankly, universities too on certain levels too. So I think a lot of these are substantial changes, but I, I do think, you know, time is going to be more important than space on this one. And if, if this pontificate lasts 10 years, I think an awful lot of those questions will be answered in the affirmative. And, and I would just add, I would say the same on family. I mean, it, it seems to me that it was really important for Francis to start with synods on the family. Um, it's where so many people experience judgment and exclusion in their lives with regard to the church. Um, but he had to say those things and do those things and have all those conversations over and over again before people, and, and, and still it's hard for people to trust. And, and I think he's still, still in the process of, of gaining that trust and saying, I see you first, I see God working in your life first, and then to try to form priests and parishes in that same kind of practice. There's so much to do. So I know that there's stuff going on over the country where people are reforming their practices and their marriage prep and, their, and the way that they are trying to be inclusive. Um, but yeah, it's gonna take a while. But, but it does seem to me that everyone knows that they have to shift. I just don't know quite how to do it yet. Yeah. I'd only add to the bishop's metaphor that in, in light of what you've said, Julie, for a lot of people, it's a surprise that trains are leaving the station. We didn't know trains could leave the station for, for a long time. Yeah, I, I, um, I, I think that we, we expect a lot. There's a lot to do and a, a lot of journalists focus on the reform of the Curia quite Honestly, I think if you went through any parish and you asked them about the reform of the Curia, nine out of 10 people would ask you, what's the Curia? Um, I think that certainly that's why he was elected. And if they have the um, departments are now turning in budgets or if they're not turning in budgets and doing a better job of accounting their money, that's one thing. But I really, what I find most astonishing about his papacy is how he's changed the way people feel about the Catholic Church, how Catholics feel about the Catholic Church. And he has made um, the Vatican a, a, a moral force again, and not just in the area of the environment. But look at what happened with relations between the US and Cuba. Look what he is trying to do in China. And, and he has elevated or raised its, made it important again. And in some ways, I would argue that's far more important to the lives of everyday Catholics than how the Vatican is organized. Quick return of serve, if I may. Yes. I agree with all that. Here's the other side. Pope Francis will one day not be Pope. When Paul VI internationalized the Curia, it was an institutional reform that outlived him you would not have Pope Francis, you wouldn't have had John Paul II. I just don't want to minimize the importance of institutional reform mm. that would outlive the church, whether the parishioners understand it or not at this point. Uh, that's what I worry about, that this wonderful charismatic pope, who we all want to see succeed, if he doesn't, uh, that's one of the reasons I, with all due respect, and I'm so happy that you're a bishop, that he lives long enough to appoint a new generation of bishops more in his image. So I, I want to just have a word for boring institutional reform that might outlive <laughs> his, his legacy or the legacy of any short-lived pope. So I'm, mm -hmm. I'm pulling for some, some progress on that front. <laughs> Let the record show what the dean has just said. Yes, Mr. Beck. I agree with you that on the, in, a, in a real sense, 
personnel is policy in this. That is, and that well, again goes to the time question and who the successor to this pope will be. Those are two very, very important questions. Mm -hmm. The one train that I feel needs to leave the station permanently and should have left a long time ago is, as you mentioned, the abuse question. It, 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 I, I don't understand. Well, let me put it this way. What I do understand is it looks culturally different in the US than it does in certain cultures in the world. That's a complex problem. Um, uh, uh, Cardinal Levada, who was the um, head of the congregation, Dr. Levada, he was the Archbishop, of he was my Archbishop for many years. And we had a long conversation about the differences in culture to try to come up with a common set of rules for the world on the thing. It was very difficult. But no matter how difficult it is, that train has to leave. That's why the Chilean case oh. is so key, because I can't figure out what happened there. But uh, for those of you who know, Archbishop Shakluna, who was sent there, is the gold standard for uh, investigators on this thing. That he, he is, is the absolute right person to have sent. He, he was the, the head of the investigation. Sort of that. And that was one thing where I had to say, Benedict got that mm -hmm. correctly. He understood what that issue was uh, and acted on. He brought in, he uh, was a Monsignor that time, Shakluna, to oversee the whole thing. And, and now Shakluna, who's the Archbishop of Malta, has gone to investigate. So I do believe there will be a, a solution to integrity. But that's the one, I don't get why that is not settled policy now in a much more full bodied way. Yes, please. Uh, I'd like to just say thank you for everybody that came and uh, the panel and the bishop and whatnot. I oh, kind of want to change the course a little more to a social justice uh, issue for Anne and, and the bishop. It's, it's kind of local. It's like politics local. Um, um, speaking in regards and not for the 2.9 million black Catholics in this country, but we like to just know when will the bishops and their local dioceses and archdioceses start really speaking to affect that things that concern black Catholics and black people in general, like incarceration. Um, really, um, when you hear our president say comments like the S-holes and whatnot, everything that's anti-Catholic social teaching, we hear you speak on DACA, we hear you speak on abortion, of course, being a Catholic, I feel the same way. I'm very pro-life. And when we stop, when will our bishops and priests stop demonizing Barack Obama? He's sitting back in his life after eight years and quit making him this abortion king and whatnot. I go to pro rallies and I still hear bishops, not bishops, excuse me, but priests and different lay people talking about Barack Obama and how he's supporting uh, abortion, this and that, and has really nothing to do with it. The man is out of office. But I don't hear anything about Trayvon Martin, only one priest that is uh, St. Sabina, their priest in Chicago, Father Flieger, and everybody else is like having a, a deaf ear. We know we're only 2.9 million. We know we don't carry a large, but our loyalty and what we've done for this faith, we think we, start, we should start hearing something that really concerns us. And, and try evangelization again, let's rewrite that instead of closing all the schools and the churches in our area. We know what more people will come, they will get better financial support. Thank you. Well, thank you. Who, who would like to address? It's, it's, uh, it's awful. I, I mean, I, I think that's where we have to start. Um, the church in the US simply hasn't dealt with, with this issue, and we haven't been there. And, and it compromises our, our ability to have a, a pro, to say that we're pro-life, to say that we have a consistent ethic of life, um, and to say that we're pro-social justice, right? Um, I mean, I, I, I think, um, at least I see, and in, in, I can speak for my own city, um, that there is, um, after the death of Michael Brown, been a new willingness of churches to 
to, um, to hold, hold conversations, to host speakers, to talk about incarceration, to try to build relationships. Um, you know, instead of maybe going to Latin America for a sister parish, build relationships right there in the city, um, which is hard and uncomfortable. Um, but people are starting to do that work. But are, are, we, are we seeing that witness um, from, from the higher places? Yeah, I, I don't think so, not yet. And I'm not sure that's something that Francis is, is going to, to do for us. Um, I would just say uh, I was happy to see it this morning on my email is the second draft of the bishop's pastoral letter on race, or on racism, which is uh, now I have to go over. I haven't looked at the second draft yet because it just came. But so that's coming near to fruition. Um, I would say one thing on the local level. Uh, maybe a year and a half ago now. The bishops' uh, conference asked the diocese all to have a day of prayer uh, for the African American community and for all of the issues of Black Lives Matter and the, the whole umbrella of issues that were so much uh, so prominent. Then. So we did it in San Diego. Actually, I invited all the leadership to the uh, cathedral for a day, the clergy um, and the legislators. But also, I invited uh, the police leadership because I was, thought it was important for them to be there. We had a very good discussion on the question. And out of that came a project that the University, I give credit to the University of San Diego, they paid for, they, they have a Kroc Institute of Peace there too. Mm -hmm. Mrs. Kroc wisely divided her money in half. <laughs> half of the peace money went to, to Notre Dame, but half went to the University of San Diego. So the Peace Institute in San Diego put together a study and, and, and a set of police procedures and best practices that we had a, a, a faith and justice dedication where we had all the same group of leadership come together just about three months ago to dedicate. So that, and all the police departments in, the, in, that re, in San Diego County agreed to abide by these principles and they were fairly specific. So there are some good sets we think, but it's infinitesimal compared. And the other thing in terms of the sentencing reform, we've been luckier in California, partly because the governor is very open to sentencing reform, but he's leaving again soon. Um, but nationally, there was great hope uh, that there would be a coalescence of political, uh, politically liberal uh, congressional leadership and conservative for economic reasons in real sentencing reform. I thought a year ago, I thought that was gonna happen and that's died, it's died sadly. But, but the correctional reform is so crucial because its consequences are so, um, so devastating for the black community but also in, in, in our area for, for, for the Hispanic community, for the white community, you know, we just have so many people in prison in California um, that it, it's, it's, it's a crying need. And I really thought we were on the cusp nationally of making some great progress where there was a coalescence of usually antagonistic political leadership and it just died. So. I, I just want to say, all of the question was not directed to me, but I am very grateful that you raised the question like that uh, for us on this on this panel, because I think uh, a question, your question, you know, challenges challenges us um, to deep self-critical reflection uh, about the ways in which religious traditions are often complicit in in structures of of oppression and violence, and uh, and often choose silence uh, in the face of uh, injustice, because of fear, of uh, taking risks. Uh, and so, you know, I, I think that every religious tradition um, is in some ways, you know, has a history of, of, of being oppressive to some group or to some, some group, some, some uh, denigrated other, some marginalized uh, other. And um, we need to, 
to um, identify, as, as, as your question challenges us, you know, who are the marginalized others today in our nations, in our communities, the various faces of oppression um, marginalized groups uh, face. And, uh, you know, if out of the deep uh, moral commitments, if, if only from the place of of recognizing every human being as, as you know, you might say in the Christian tradition to be created in the Imago Dei that doesn't exclude anyone, or, or, or as I would speak in the Hindu tradition, the relative God in, in, identically in every human being. That's enough ground for, for, for religious people to speak out, as you have said, about the problem of, of incarceration, about injustice and legal and systems and law enforcement about you know the marginalization of, of, of minorities. So we have we have a responsibility and I thank you for you know lifting that issue and reminding us um, that we are we are too silent uh, today in the face of all of these uh, issues. A one last return of serve. <laughs> <laughs> okay I'd just like to say uh, Thank you and thank you to the bishop for what you're trying to do and in your diocese. I just say your brethren, the, the, the bishops, uh, Bishop Braxton was here like last, last week and whatnot. I just think if you guys really just open your eyes, I don't know how political correct it is and uh, who won't be a Monsignor, who all of that, but Black Catholics is a small group, but they're crying out their vital group because if you look at Los Angeles, if you look at a lot of cities, they helped found at Chicago and whatnot, and they just really, Black Lives Matter, Black Catholic Lives Matter, and it's just not like a few nice people who choose to be here. We feel that this is our church, along with your church, it's a universal church, and we really need to start to adhere to that. Thank you very much. Thank you, and I thank all of you for your attendance and your attention, your questions and your thought. I look forward to conversations going forward into the future. If you would, one final thank you for our panelists. Thank you so much.